Hello, today we're continuing in our GCSE Physics Revision series looking at changing states of matter. In the previous video we learned about three states of matter solid, liquid and gas. I told you that there was indeed a fourth state which is plasma but that occurs at very high temperatures and we can ignore it for these purposes. What we're going to look at in this video is how you change from solid to liquid and from liquid to gas. Normally we would say that a solid changes to a liquid at its melting point and that it changes from a liquid to a gas at its boiling point. If we think about water for example, water will change from solid ice to liquid water at 0 degrees centigrade and it will change from liquid water to uh, gas at 100 degrees centigrade. That's the melting and boiling point of water respectively. I should say that that happens at what's called the standard atmospheric pressure or standard pressure. That is the, as it were, the pressure that you have, the air pressure you have on the surface of the earth. If you go up to the top of Mount Everest, you will find that water will boil at a lower temperature than 100 degrees Celsius or centigrade because the pressure is lower and consequently the water can boil at a lower temperature. When we change a material from solid to liquid, we say that we melt it. When we change a material from liquid to gas, we usually say, though we'll talk more about this in a moment, that we boil it. To do either of those things, you have to add heat, put heat into the system in order to change the state from solid to liquid or liquid to gas. If you take heat out of the system, in other words, you cool it, then you go the other way, and when we go from gas to liquid, we call that condense, and when we go from liquid to solid, we call that freeze. What is actually happening when we go from solid to liquid to gas? Well, we remember back to our previous video where we explained the differences between these three states of matter. The principal difference was the extent to which forces hold the molecules together. In a solid, the molecules are moving very little, there's not much energy, Consequently, there are strong bonds that hold the molecules together. In liquids, there are much weaker bonds. Consequently, the molecules have a much higher degree of movement. They have more energy. When you get to a gas, there's hardly any bonds at all. And the gases are free to go, the gas molecules are free to go wherever they like. They have high degree of movement, high degree of energy. So what you're effectively doing when you go from solid to liquid is you're giving enough energy in the form of heat to, as it were, overcome the bonds that hold it into solid form and give the molecules enough energy to be in liquid form. Similarly, when you go from liquid to gas, you're giving the liquid enough heat, enough energy, that you can overcome the limited bonds, the weak bonds, in order to produce a gas where there's hardly any bonds at all. When you cool down, you're essentially taking energy out of the system so in other words, you're taking out the kinetic energy of the gas molecules. They now much move much slower and the weak bonds can start to take effect. If you take more energy out, you cool down still further, you slow the molecules down even more and now the strong forces can take over and it becomes a solid. Different materials have different melting points and boiling points. For example, at room temperature, iron is a solid. Water, H2O, is a liquid. And air, which consists principally of oxygen and nitrogen, is a gas. So effectively, um, at room temperature, the temperature and therefore the heat available is insufficient to break the strong bonds that hold the iron molecules together. Whereas at room temperature, the heat available is sufficient to break the bonds that hold the solid form of water together, that's ice, but they're insufficient to break the bonds that would enable water to become a gas. Whereas at room temperature, 
The bonds that hold oxygen and nitrogen together have long since been broken and they can now form a gas at room temperature. So we can see that heat going into a system or coming out has two quite different effects. Sometimes when you add heat to a system, you find that the temperature rises. And similarly, if you take heat out, the temperature falls. But on other occasions, when you put heat in, the temperature doesn't change, but the state does. In other words, it changes from solid to liquid or liquid to gas. If you put heat into ice at 0 degrees centigrade, you produce water at 0 degrees centigrade. No change in temperature, but a change in state. And to get that change in state, you had to add heat. Now, so far, we've been talking about changing states at specific points, the melting point and the boiling point. But of course, it's perfectly possible for something like water to change from liquid state to gas state at a temperature below 100 degrees. We call that evaporation. So when water moves from being a liquid to being a gas at a temperature lower than the boiling point, this can even happen at room temperature. It can happen at any temperature, but it can happen at room temperature. We call that evaporation. And when it goes the other way, when the gas turns back to a liquid, again, possibly at room temperature, then we call that condensation. Let's look and see what's happening. Well, here's a container and it's got water in it. So this is all water. And what does kinetic theory tell us? It says that water is made up, of course, of millions of molecules. And they are all moving because they have some capacity to move. There are weak bonds holding them. And they will have a variety of velocities and in all different directions. Those molecules, of course, are bumping into one another. As they do so, they will exchange energy. They will move faster. They will move slower. So you've got a whole range, a distribution of velocities of all these molecules. Now consider a molecule close to the surface. If it has enough energy, which means it has enough velocity, and if it's moving in the right direction, that is upwards, it can actually escape from the surface. And it has essentially evaporated. That molecule of water has become a molecule of water vapor. It is now um, a gas. That can only happen, of course, if that molecule is moving fast enough to escape. If it's moving in the right direction, for example, if it's moving in that direction with the right velocity, that will be no good at all because all that will happen is it will bump into other molecules and exchange energy and probably slow down. And if it's right at the bottom of the tank, again, even if it has the right energy, that won't do it any good because long before it gets to the surface, it will have bumped into other molecules, it will have exchanged energy, it will have slowed down. So it critically only happens at the surface. And if the molecule has enough energy and if the molecule is moving in the right direction. And this, as I say, can even happen at room temperature. Now, what happens when those molecules that are close to the surface and moving in the right direction escape from the liquid and form water vapour. Well, what is essentially happening is that fast moving molecules, in other words, high energy molecules, are escaping. So the total energy that remains is lower. If the energy is lower, that means the overall temperature will be lower. So the effect of the loss of the fast moving molecules when water evaporates is that the water that remains, all other things being equal, will fall in temperature. Because what remains is lower energy, and lower energy is associated with lower temperature. And the human body makes use of this in the principle of sweating. Here are you. And beads of sweat form on your brow. 
that's liquid. It's not quite water, but let's assume it is. What is happening? Well, the, you're hot, that's why you sweat. So that uh, liquid is already quite warm. Some of the molecules of the sweat have enough energy and moving in the right direction to escape as vapour. When they do, the high energy molecules that escape leave lower energy molecules behind. That means they are cooler. Consequently, your forehead feels cooler because the high energy uh, molecules have taken energy away and into the air as vapour, leaving lower energy molecules behind, which will therefore have a lower temperature, and that lower temperature is what cools you. That's the principle of sweat. Evaporation of sweat takes high energy molecules away and cools what's left, that is, you. Now let's think about condensation. Consider a kettle. There's the spout, there's the lid. When the water in the kettle is boiling, and for these purposes I'm now talking about true boiling of water at 100 degrees, then what you will see is a cloud of steam. Now, in the previous video, I did very cautiously say that when water becomes a gas, I said, if you like, you can call it steam. Strictly, of course, it is water vapour. You cannot see uh, water vapour in the air. There are droplets, or well, there, there is a gaseous form of water in the air. You can't see it. It's invisible. What you see from a kettle is indeed steam. But what steam actually is, is very small condensed droplets of water in the air. In other words, the boiling water has produced uh, water vapour, and that's why there's, when if you look at a kettle when it's boiling, there's a very small region um, from the spout where you can't see anything, you can't see steam, because that is the invisible water vapour in the air. But as it gets further away from the kettle, the steam, sorry, the water vapour is hitting the colder air and consequently the water vapour is condensing in the air, forming very small droplets. And that's what you see as steam. That's the sort of white smoky stuff that comes out of the kettle. It's condensed water. So actually these are condensed droplets because the uh, water vapour at 100 degrees has met air, which is probably at room temperature, has cooled and forms droplets of water in the air. But condensation can take place not just at 100 degrees. Uh, you may well have found in the morning that when you wake up, there is condensation on the inside of your window. The reason is that you've got a warm room and that warm room will have molecules of water vapour, which you cannot see. But when, you're, when those molecules hit what is essentially a cold window, because it's cold outside, and that's usually a condition, it has to be much colder outside, then what happens is that those um, water vapour molecules will condense on the surface of the window and that's why you get condensation on the inside. Many of you who wear glasses or spectacles will know the phenomena of coming in from a cold, um, out, coming in from outside on a cold day, and you come into a warm room and immediately your glasses steam up. Well, that's exactly the same thing. What is happening is your glasses are cold because they've been outside. You come into a warm room, the water vapor in the air, which touches your glasses, condenses on them and forms a very film, uh, thin film of essentially condensation on your glasses. So what are the conditions for evaporation and condensation? Remember, evaporation and condensation can take place at any temperature, including room temperature, but some things will accelerate the rate of evaporation or condensation. For evaporation, you will get more evaporation if the temperature goes up. Yes, um, a puddle will evaporate um, in normal, on a normal day, but if the temperature rises, it will evaporate quicker. By contrast, 
condensation will happen when the temperature falls, particularly if you've got a big difference. You come in from a cold outside to a warm inside, then there will be condensation on your glasses. Evaporation also is affected by the density of the liquid concerned. If you have a low density liquid, it's more likely to evaporate than a high density liquid. And similarly, you're more likely to get condensation if you have an, a high density gas that is going to condense into a liquid. Thirdly, surface area will affect evaporation. The greater the surface area, the greater the evaporation. Why? Because I told you that evaporation is a surface effect. Molecules have to be close to the surface and travelling in the right direction in order to evaporate. So the greater the surface area you've got, the more likely you're going to have molecules that will be able to escape from it. Condensation, however, is not so much affected by surface area, but the relative temperature of the surface. And that's exactly what we had up here. If you have a difference between a cold surface and a warm room, then condensation will be affected. And the warmer the room and the colder the outside, the more condensation you're likely to get. And finally, it's affected by airflow. If you have more of an airflow over the ground, you'll get greater acceleration. If you have less airflow, you're more likely to get condensation. So, if uh, you've got a puddle on the ground, you're likely to find that it will evaporate faster, all other things being equal, if the wind is blowing, because then you've got an airflow. It will evaporate less quickly if you've got still air. This is not necessarily the case everywhere in the world because the extent to which evaporation can happen is affected by what's called humidity. Humidity is essentially the amount of water vapour, that is the gas form of water, that is in the air. And there's a maximum amount that the air can hold. So if you get to the maximum amount, then you don't get any more evaporation because there's nowhere for the water vapour to go. And so in some parts of the world, um, you will find that puddles never evaporate because the atmosphere or the air is uh, saturated with water vapour. It can't take any more. And that's why when you're in those parts of the world, sweating doesn't do you any good because the uh, water in the sweat cannot vaporise, it cannot uh, evaporate because the air is already saturated with water. So you feel very hot and clammy um, because there can be no evaporation. This principle of evaporation in airflow is a means by which some people tell the direction that the wind is blowing. If you're standing outside and you lick your finger so that your finger is moist and then you turn your finger round so that you're facing in different directions, there will come a point where your finger will suddenly feel a lot colder. And that's because the wind is blowing straight into it and causing more evaporation. And of course that means that what's left will cool down. So you'll often find people um, licking their finger and pointing in the air, pointing around to find out which direction the wind is blowing, because it's when the finger feels coldest, that's where the wind is blowing uh, from. So we've spoken about boiling, which happens for water, let's say at 100 degrees centigrade at standard pressure, and evaporation, which can happen at any temperature, including room temperature. So what's the essential difference between boiling and evaporation? Well, we've just said that boiling takes place at 100 degrees, whereas evaporation can take place at any temperature, including room temperature. Boiling tends to be very quick, whereas evaporation is slow. If you look at a saucepan of water that is boiling, you will find that all of it is boiling. There will be bubbles throughout the whole of the liquid. Whereas, as we've already said, the point about evaporation is that it is a surface effect. It is just the molecules at the surface that have enough energy to escape. Whereas when a liquid is boiling, you have essentially given it enough heat that pretty much all the molecules are capable of getting the 
uh, energy they need to change state from liquid into gas. I want to briefly consider heat transfer. We've already said that if you have a body that is hotter than its surroundings, heat will flow out of it. Heat always flows from hotter to colder spontaneously. You can force it to go the other way around, but spontaneously hot bodies will always radiate heat out to a cooler region. Now, in some cases, of course, you want to keep as much heat in as possible. For example, if you've got a hot water tank that you've spent money on electricity heating, you don't want to waste that heat escaping. So you put some kind of insulating material around it so that the heat cannot escape by conducting or convecting or uh, by radiating. Um, that's quite deliberately trying to keep the heat in. But there are other occasions where you want the heat to get out. For example, if you have a radiator in your room, you don't want to insulate that because the whole point of a radiator is to let the heat get out into the room. So you want it to escape so that it can warm the room. And generally speaking, the rate at which that heat will escape depends on the surface area of the, in this case, the radiator and the volume. The greater they are, the greater the amount of heat that can escape. That makes sense. If you've got a large volume and a large surface area, then more heat will flow away from that radiator. If you take a thing like a car engine, car engines get very hot. And in fact, they could get so hot that they might melt some of the materials that make the engines, and that's no good at all. So you need to cool engines down to keep them running efficiently. One of the ways we do that is to have a coolant which flows past the engine, often water, but the idea is it's a flowing water, so this is essentially carrying the heat away. But there is also often around the engine what we call metal fins. Um, and they are shaped kind of rather like this. Metal because, as you know, metal is a good conductor of heat. So the metal will conduct the heat away from the engine and thus taking heat away will cool the engine. But also if you have it in this shape, there's a huge surface area. Every one of these lines here is essentially a surface and they are all radiating heat away. So that kind of set of fins, they're called, that helps to radiate heat away from a car engine. And as I've said, the type of material is important. You want to use a metal which is a good conductor of heat, not an insulator, because that won't conduct the heat away. These devices are sometimes called heat sinks. Um, because they, uh, as it were, drain the heat away, rather like a, si a sink has a drain draining the water away. These drain the heat away from where you don't want it and enable it to radiate away into the air. So let's just review what we've done in this particular video. We've looked at the general principle of changing state from solid to liquid to gas. To go from solid to liquid or from liquid to gas, you have to add energy in the form of heat to go from gas to liquid or liquid to solid, you have to take away energy in the form of heat, which means you have to cool it down. What we have learned is that when you add heat, that normally means that the temperature increases. If you add heat to water at, say, 20 degrees Celsius, you would expect to find that it goes up to, say, 21 degrees Celsius. The temperature will rise. But what we've now learned is that heat can sometimes not produce a change in temperature, but a change in state. That is to say, you could take ice at 0 degrees centigrade and add heat and get water at 0 degrees centigrade. Now, there's no change in temperature, but there has been a change in state. So heat sometimes results in a change in temperature, but when you get to critical points, the melting point and the boiling point, heat can change the state from solid to liquid or from liquid to gas. 
Now precisely how much energy you have to give to do any of those things we'll consider in the next video.